All right. Uh, so what I want to talk about in this uh, presentation is just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to focus on. Um, I'm going to actually talk about my journey from functional to reactive programming. Uh, I want to talk about my learning. Uh, this talk is not entirely about reactive programming, but you know, more of a discovery, if you will, my discovery of uh, reactive programming. Um, when it comes to uh, programming, I've been programming for about 35 years now, and over the first, uh, past 35 years, what I realized was learning a language is not really hard. Learning an API or a library is not really hard. But what is really hard is paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts are really hard because it forces you to think very differently. So I think I've had about maybe six paradigm shifts in my life. And uh, I'll talk about some of those paradigm shifts. The very first paradigm shift I had was learning to program itself. That probably was the most difficult thing to begin with. Uh, because when I was a young uh, uh, you know, student, I wanted to learn programming, but I didn't have access to computers back then. Uh, so some of my programs, I actually wrote them on paper. And I had the best compilers in the world. They're called human beings. And uh, they read through my code and told me if I got it or not. And some of the initial things I wrote was algorithms. And I had people help me read algorithms and tell me if I'm in the right direction. I didn't even have access to computers until I actually got fairly good in programming without having a computer. And then, of course, it's a question of typing it in and running it on the computer. So that took a while. So that was my very first paradigm shift, is to learn to program. Uh, but my first initial programming languages were like uh, VB and Pascal and C. And so my second paradigm shift was learning to program object-oriented. And to learn about polymorphism, to learn about uh, you know, writing code and making it extensible. And I programmed in C++ for several years. You know how much struggle that was. And uh, I started actually teaching C++ uh, for several uh, decades actually after that. And, uh, and, and uh, spent most of the time doing that. My third paradigm shift was Com and Corba. I will not wish that on an enemy. That was a terrible thing to do. Uh, in fact, the only thing I fear these days is one day my children will find out that I once did COM programming. I'm really worried about what would they think of that if they find out that you did COM programming? I mean, that's, how do you defend against that? But uh, that, that was the time. The reason I really did not like COM and Corba was not because it didn't work. Actually, it did. The point is I had no clue why it worked. And uh, I wanted to really understand how things work. And eventually I started writing COM programming purely using C. And once I saw it working, I was happy with that after that. My fourth paradigm shift was uh, trying to understand asynchronous programming in JavaScript and Node. That was really hard because by then I had programmed in languages like Java and C++ and C Sharp. And trying to understand asynchrony took quite a while and understanding how you can actually program with uh, Node. My fifth paradigm shift was functional programming. And it was really hard because everybody said it was good and easy and nice. I'm like, no, this is not like everything, anything I do. Uh, I grew up programming in imperative style. And then suddenly telling me that I should really use transformations rather than using uh, the functions I'm familiar with was extremely hard. Uh, and then the uh, sixth paradigm shift was reactive programming. And, and so when I started really learning reactive programming, it was frustrating because there was a lot of literature I was reading. It was telling me how wonderful reactive programming is and how what it means to you know, develop reactive applications. And uh, there was a lot of hand waving. And, and I'm like, show me the code kind of person. I want to see things in code. And when people talk about stuff, I get really angry because I want to see it working, not being talked about. And that was a really hard transition for me. And that's the last journey I want to talk about, my journey in learning reactive programming. Well, let's talk a little bit quickly about imperative versus declarative programming for a second. We talked about this in the previous presentation, but just to lay the stage for it, let's say for a minute we have a list of, let's say, string. We'll call it as names for a minute. And in this case, I'm going to say equal to arrays dot, let's say, as list. I'm going to create a list of, let's say, names values. Let's call this as uh, Nemo names for a minute. So I've got a bunch of names. My question is, does this collection have Nemo in it? Well, to find out, what do we do in the imperative style? In the imperative style, what we would do is 
we would first say over here, a Boolean found is equal to false. Now, once we create this variable, we would then say for string name that comes from the names, and then we would say if name dot, and then of course, you better not say double equals, it better be dot equals. You gotta make those kinds of decisions very carefully. And then you say if it is Nemo, then what are you gonna do? Then you say found is equal to uh, true. Uh, then of course, you say if found is really true, then you may output, let's say, Nemo found, Otherwise, you may output maybe a sad music and say, a Nemo not found. But as an observant reader, you say, hey, Venkat, you're not done. You better don't forget to put a break right here. Because if you forget to put a break, in the best case, you get a slow performance. In the worst case, you get a wrong result. So it's important for you to really do that as well. Well, that's an example of an imperative style code. Now, of course, honestly, if you're writing code like this, the chances are you didn't call it as found. You probably called it tem or even t because that's the way you tell the variable you don't, uh, you don't uh, deserve to live. I hate you, that's what you say to these variables. These are called garbage variables and we don't like them too much. And of course, we take the ceremony to write the code like this. Well, of course, in the declarative style of programming, we could do this very nicely and how does the declarative style of programming look like for this purpose? Well, what we will do here is we will simply start out, let's just take the last part alone, look, looks like all the code we wrote is not really needed, and what we can do in here is we can say names.contains, and then simply say Nemo right here in one shot. That's pretty insane, isn't it? Because with just one line of code, you are able to get the whole thing done. Of course, the question is, uh, what is going on within the contains method? I'll let you take a stab at it. Any suggestions? What do you think is happening within the contains method? Yeah, so you, uh, you know, you pointed out it is doing exactly this. That's one answer, absolutely. Uh, contains is probably doing exactly this. Any other answers? Maybe it's parallel, who knows, right? Maybe it's using some other really fantastic algorithm. The answer I like the most is called, I don't care. Okay, that was a little rude. Let me rephrase it. It's encapsulated. Okay, that sounds a lot better, isn't it? So what is it's encapsulated? So what does it's encapsulated really mean? I don't care, right? That's what it really means. Well, in all honesty, we all in this room know one thing. We do care. But there's one big difference, though. The code in the top does not give us an option. It doesn't come to you and say, do you want this detail right now? The code in the top is like listening to grandma. Uh, I'll tell you, my grandma, she can never stop talking. And you will like, she's in autopilot mode, right? She will give you all the details that you never care about. And she doesn't care whether you're listening or not. She's giving you the boatload of stuff. That's the code in the top, right? It says, you're here, you're here you go. The code in the bottom is a bit more considerate. It says, if you don't care about it, I will not bother you with it now. If you really want to know, here's where you go find it. So the detail is always there available for us but it's given to us when we care about it, not thrust upon us whether we care about it or not. That's basically what declarative is, that we have access to that when we really need it. But of course, we talked about declarative function on the previous presentation. We talked about how the higher order functions can take us towards it. And given this, of course, we are able to really honor the immutability in code. So what's the point of all of this? Well, the point of all of this is that we really want to move towards the functional composition and the laziness of evaluation. Those are extremely critical things to do. So when it comes to function composition and lazy evaluation, these are probably the most important features when it comes to the uh, uh, functional style of programming is we want to be able to enjoy the capability. So for example, if we turn this around into a, a functional style of code uh, to let's say find the uh, let's say the first person whose name is five characters long, we could say, for example, output right here, 
And we could say names.stream, where a stream is an internal iterator, then we can say filter given a name, name.length is equal to five characters long, and then we can simply say find the first, and ask for the first person, uh, first, uh, uh, first name that is five characters in length. We could also transform it to uppercase if you really are interested in doing it. We could say string or two uppercase, and, and then once we do it, we can then say what if the value is not found. We could say or else, we, we can say, uh, well, nothing found, for example, and we can ask it to print the results. So that becomes a really nice way to uh, provide this functional uh, style of programming. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, Google for the following. Uh, Google for the words uh, collection pipeline, uh, pipeline uh, pattern. And uh, so pipeline, if I know how to spell it, uh, pattern. And this is a, a blog post by uh, Martin Fowler. And he talks about how we are moving towards this direction of uh, programming with these collections of uh, pipelines of functions. So this is a very com uh, compelling way to move forward in our field. Rather than using the for loops and while loops we have been using for a very long time, we are now beginning to move towards this collection pipeline pattern where we are able to express the problem with a uh, lot less uh, complexity. So I'm going to say uh, imperative style uh, uh, you know, uh, is a bit to it accidental complexity, uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, what we are dealing with here is a functional and declarative style uh, has uh, less complexity. Uh, where this is really uh, you know, interesting because this is uh, declarative, of course. Um, so one of the reasons why uh, this is interesting is uh, imperative style is something we are very familiar with. On the other hand, uh, declarative style is a lot, of, lot uh, largely unfamiliar to a lot of us. It turns out what we are very familiar with is actually more complex, and what we are not very familiar with is actually simpler. And, and, and so once we get familiar with it, it becomes really easy to uh, write the code with it. So that brings up the question, uh, what are we really after? We are after elegance, but not only just elegance, but also efficiency as well. Both of those are very important. So one of the points I wanted to really bring about here is that about efficiency. I'm going to say efficiency is attained not by doing things faster, but by avoiding things that shouldn't be done in the first place. You can never be faster than not doing a particular work. And, and that is one of the best ways to be efficient. If you really look at busy people uh, who are really responsive, they are not responsive because they do a lot. It is because they actually don't take on stuff they don't want to. I have this philosophy in life. The more yes you say, the less you actually deliver. The more no you say, the more you actually deliver. So it's one of the efficiencies is where you pick priorities and say, these are things I want to really do. These are things not worth doing. I'm not going to do it. And, and that's exactly what it comes to code as well, is you want to pick and choose what part of the code you want to execute, what you don't want to execute. That becomes really uh, important. So from that point of view, here's another way to think about it. Uh, I live in a, a bear country, meaning when we go on hikes or when we are just trying, uh, up and about, uh, we may eventually run into a bear, which is very nerve-wracking because can you imagine uh, turning a corner and there's a big bear in front of you? Uh, but then they told me, you don't have to worry about it too much, and that really helped me a lot. Because they said, when a bear is behind you, you don't have to be the fastest, per you don't have to run very fast. You simply have to be faster than the person behind you. I think it's a really smart approach in life, isn't it? So, so that's exactly what it is, is you don't have to be running really fast, you just have to run efficiently, that's what it counts to. So from that point of view, I want to transition to talk about reactive programming. When I started looking at reactive programming, my first question was, why yet another programming model? You know, haven't we had enough programming model? Do we need one more? And the first question is, react to what? And what does it really mean to program reactively? Well, then I realized we work in a field where every 10 years, we'll give a new name for what we already do, and get really excited about it. And this time around, things like microservices, reactive programming, 
And, and this is the fun part of be, becoming old in this field. Because you can just sit there and watch through the window and every few years people give a different name for what you already do. And, and then you, you know, analyze it and say, oh, back in time we called it this. And, and this is the fun part. Reactive programming is not new at all. It's been around for a very long time. But Microsoft Research, Eric Meyer was working in Microsoft Research, and he decided to give a new term for this. He called it reactive programming. Well, you see the word reactive has a negative connotation in American English. You never go to a person in America and say, you're a reactive person. They won't be a friend with you anymore because you just insulted them. People in America want to be proactive, not reactive. Had Eric thought about this, he would have called it proactive programming than calling it reactive programming. We'd have had twice the number of people in the room today than we do today, right now. And, and unfortunately, he called it reactive programming. The reason he called it reactive programming is it's an application that responds to stimuli. As things happen, it responds to it. I'll give you two examples of reactive programs, and, and, and I'm sure you would recognize both of them. The first one is probably the best application humans have ever created hands down, Microsoft Excel. I don't think anybody can argue with it, isn't it? Because Microsoft Excel, you modify a cell, and before you could blink your eyes, all the cells that depend on it immediately change. And then recursively, all the cells that depend on those cells change, and then this ripples through all the spreadsheets and make the changes. That's an example of a reactive program. What a phenomenal uh, uh, application. And, and you don't have to sit there and you know, do stuff. You just change a cell, and, and within, before you can blink your eyes, everything changes reactively. Uh, I discovered reactive programming in a slightly different way, and I was just blown away by this because I never thought about it that way. I travel almost 100%, uh, so I'm very rarely at home. My children have learned about asynchrony very early on in their life. Uh, usually it's like, Dad, can I ask a question? No. Dad, I sent you a message, you'll get a response back. So we know asynchrony very quickly. But we communicate as a family through electronic documents. I'm always in a different time zone, so it's very hard to synchronize on a time we can talk, but we update documents, my family updates documents, we communicate really well through this, to a point of efficiency. So we are always on top of what's going on in our family, even though we're not in the same time zone most of the time. But I, I almost accidentally discovered this. I was on a trip in some remote part of the world one morning. I wake up, I log on to Google Docs, and I noticed that at that very moment, I was about to update the document, and I noticed that my wife has updated the document, but more important, I noticed that she was actually updating the document at the very moment back at home. And immediately I scrolled down and I found the exact location where she was updating. And at that moment, I put my cursor exactly where her cursor was and I started changing the same exact location. <laughs> With this I found out you could be thousands of miles away and still find a way to annoy your spouse. <laughs> to me, this is the best application of reactive programming. Because for her to say, get out of my document now, was absolutely precious. I was absolutely sold on this idea by then. So, and then I realized, I constantly work with people around the world. I work with people who are in remote parts of the world. We communicate through these documents constantly. Sometimes 20 or 30 of us update a document and we all get notified. What a phenomenal application. Literally at a given time, millions of people use these uh, applications and they get uh, in sync with each other and, and get notified. That's an example of reactive applications. But if you really think about it, where, what have we done in the past about 15, 20 years? I can summarize that into one acronym called CRUD. And we have been developing applications where we create data, read data, update data, and occasionally delete data. And at some point you wake up in the morning and say, is life just CRUD or have you gone overboard with it? And, and then when we realize, maybe that's not the way we should really have things. So if you really think about it, what did we do in the past? We took the data from the database, we read the data into a process or a function, and then what did we do from there? We update the database. 
Now, this really becomes a very sad way to live as a programmer, isn't it? Because you read the data from a database and you put it back into the database. What fun is that, right? So how did the day go? Oh, I took more data and put it back into the database. That's what we keep doing over and over and over. And at some point you realize, maybe that's not the way we should live. Well, it turns out a lot of applications we develop today don't fall in this category. For example, what if I want to develop an application where I want to monitor tweets for a product? Hey, are they talking about good things about a product? Are they talking about bad things about a product? Is customers reporting errors and problems with the product or a particular service? Maybe I want to monitor. What database are you reading the tweets from? Well, of course it's not a database. It's a timeline and you're just monitoring it. Oh, I want to buy this Tesla stock, but it's not in the right price. What database are you going to read the stock price from? Of course, it's not a database I subscribe to a service. It sends me data, and I either ignore what I receive or process it and send a request to another service for processing. So suddenly, we take a data, and then we send it to a function. And what happens after that? We then produce another data, and another data, another data, another data. And suddenly, what we are doing is a little bit different than what we used to. We are going through what's called a data flow computing. And data flow computing is really where the, uh, the effort today is. Now, if you have been around in the 1980s, now this is a little frustrating, I'll tell you this, because I was in a conference giving a keynote. And I finished my keynote, I got down and I sat down in the first seat, and there was a you know, wonderful, nice lady sitting there, and she said, you know, hey, that was a really a nice talk, thanks for coming. I said, well, I'm absolutely I'm thrilled, thank you. And then she said, can I ask you a personal question? I said, lady, I don't do personal questions, but thanks for coming, we're done. She said, no, 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 I, I, I've been working in the industry for two years, I have a master's. You know, when somebody tells you they, are working, they finished a master's program, they're working for two years, you kind of can edge, uh, you know, gauge the age of the lady, even though that's not a good thing to do. So I kind of know how old she is. And then, I, and then she said, I finished my master's, I've been working for two years. Uh, I, please allow me to ask this personal question. I said, okay, you get one personal question, no more than that. And then she said, what year did you graduate from school? I said, no, 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 we don't do this stuff. No, 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 let's not do that. We're done with this topic. Thank you for coming. We're done. She said, no, 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 please tell me what you graduated. I said, all right. And I told her the year I graduated. Her face just blooms and says, really? That's the year I was born. And I didn't know what to say at this point. Because here's a person who's a colleague in the industry, and she was born the year I graduated from college. I said, do, could you do me a favor for me? She said, what can I do for you? I said, could you reach over the cane for me? I need some help to get up and walk right now. And I suddenly felt with it. But then I realized this is amazing because the people who are born after I graduated are the colleagues in the industry. That is new thinking, new way of thoughts in the industry. That's amazing. So, so when I say, if you went around in the 80s, I sometimes have people in the world, you know, room saying, what do you mean 80s, right? So yeah, they were not even born at the time. But if you were around in the 80s, you could not have walked the malls in the city without people chanting the word, data flow, data flow. Like today, can you walk through the streets without somebody here saying the word microservices in the background? You hear this all the time. I was in Starbucks about uh, last week. I just wanted to have a quiet time for crying out loud. I was just working, and all I could hear people in the background saying JavaScript, React, Angular, and then microservices. I'm like, could you please shut up? I'm trying to get my work done here, right? And then this is the way it was in the 80s, people talking about data flow computing. So what if I tell you I've got some great news for you we can do data flow computing today. I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Grandpa, sit down. We're not interested in you telling us about data flow computing. I'll tell this to you in a way you would say, oh my gosh, it's the best thing ever. What if I can tell you we can do Amazon Lambdas and we can also do serverless programming? You're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. What if I told you is we can do data flow computing, right? Well, so I realized what we are doing today what we are doing today is not a new technology. We didn't really create new technologies to say, oh my gosh, this is new. When people tell me Amazon Lambdas and serverless is new, I'm like, no, it's a new name we gave for things. It's even better. And why it's better is, I remember as a young child, 
I, I was reading books on data flow computing. And you know what? It was the saddest of all days. Because I would read these books, and then I would stare through the window, and I would ask myself, wouldn't it be so cool to actually write that code? And I couldn't. And the reason I couldn't is, you have to belong to an elite company, or you have to be part of a big university for you to do data flow computing back then. What we are enjoying today is not new technology, something even better. And I call this as democratiz uh, democratization of technology. And this is superb in my opinion, because we are living the age of democratization of technology. My children can get access to computing for a few cents that I could not even imagine when I was a child. And I think this is phenomenal. I'm almost in tears when I say this to you. Because that's really what the world is about, isn't it? The ability for any common person to be able to get access to technology is what it's all about. And, and we are living the age of democratization technology. Anyone can get access to these computing power. And I think that's phenomenal, right? And so what we have in our hands is a true democratization of technology. We can do data flow computing today. Not that we couldn't do it before, but it's affordable today. And I think that's really phenomenal, in my opinion. That's what we are living today. So we are living in this world of democratizing these technologies so we can actually use that for what we do. And that, I think, is extremely powerful. So we are back again doing data flow computing. So what in the world is reactive programming? So reactive programming is uh, really, uh, in, in, in so many different words, data flow computing. That's what we really are doing. That was my first realization, to realize that reactive programming is data flow computing, we just are rebranding it in a lot of different ways, and that's what we're doing. In that point of view, there are a few things we really need to think about. If you think about uh, object-oriented programming for just a few minutes, so in object-oriented programming, uh, what did we really do? We had four pillars of object-oriented programming, if you remember. What is the first thing? Abstraction. Keep in mind, abstraction was not new to object-oriented programming. In fact, abstraction was talked about people like Plato several centuries ago. So this is nothing new at all. We just celebrate that in object-oriented programming. Then comes along uh, en 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 encapsulation. And what is encapsulation? Well, encapsulation is, of course, information hiding. Again, that's not new to object-oriented programming. We have done encapsulation in functions. Local variables are encapsulated. We already know this. It was not new to object-oriented programming. What's the third pillar of this paradigm? And that is inheritance. The only inheritance I know is inheriting pain using this feature. But that's still part of this paradigm after all. But the most important feature of object-oriented programming, which is again not unique to object-oriented programming, is polymorphism. And polymorphism is really what gives us extensibility in object-oriented programming. Much like that, reactive programming also has uh, four pillars of the paradigm. And this is documented in Reactive Manifesto. And they talk about our uh, uh, focusing on four things to make this really happen. So what are the four things that reactive programming really provides for us? We'll come to this in just a minute. So it is an ability to respond to the stimuli and, but the question is, why do we need this new programming model? One of the reasons for that is, we are living a very different world today than only about 10, 15 years ago. 10, 15 years ago, companies created applications for their employees to use. When employees use applications, those employees are called as captive users. What is a captive user? Nobody cares what they think about. If a captive user complains, the answer is you shut up and get back to your work. And today, we are making applications for real world users to use. When you have a real world user, if the application doesn't respond properly or it's very sluggish and slow, the user moves on to other things. It's a lost business. So we need to create applications that are really responsive, that becomes important, that's reliable as well. At the same time though, when it comes to creating applications, we are also in a different world today. Every single one of us carry many different devices with us. It's not those old days when, I remember almost nostalgic when I think about it. I used to wake up in the morning, I would log on to my BP100 terminal, and then I would log on to the modem, and the, I can hear that modem whoosh and whoosh and whoosh. 
while my coffee pot is brewing, brewing coffee, the modem will connect and disconnect and reconnect. And then I'll call my friends and ask them, what's your baud rate today? And they will tell me they got 98 bards. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you're, how, how do you have such a fast modem today? And, and this is amazing. We live in a day to day. Every one of us carry multiple internet-enabled devices. The other day, I parried my son, and several devices fell off him. <laughs> I don't even know how many he carries with him. And, and that's the world we live in. I mean, forget about watches, I'm telling you. We are talking about days when we are having wearable devices. Nose rings, ear rings, tongue rings are internet-enabled, and constantly transferring data. Your doctor may call you and say, I suggest you sit down, your heart rate is really you know, bad right now. And you can say, oh, I'm just fine, I'm listening to this crazy guy called Venkat. That's why my heart rate is pounding right now. But the point is, we could be not far from being monitored by people, uh, for, by doctors and healthcare. That's the world we are living in today. It's a very different programming world we live in. We need a different programming model for that, for meeting these applications. So the question really is, rather than living in the world of uh, a crud, what about thinking of data stream or data flow moving forward? So it's transforming data. So that brings up to reactive applications. What are the things we are really looking for? Well, the very first thing is, when you are looking at applications, we are talking about a big scale, we talk about big data. Well, big data is large volume of data, but large uh, frequency of data as well. We're talking about flights that are flying right now, generating 1.5 terabytes of data per second. Can you imagine tapping into a flight and 1.5 terabyte of data being generated every single second? Uh, I recently took a 16-hour flight. I can't even tell you how much data that was, right? And, and if you're processing that data live as it is going on, how do we really go about doing it? So it's, it's clear our computing power is not sufficient. If I have a machine with 256 cores on it, the number of threads, unfortunately, is less than or equal to number of cores uh, for, uh, for, uh, for computation intensive uh, tasks. You cannot have more cores, uh, more threads than the number of cores if your job is computation intensive. This is the reason we have technology like, like Spark and Hadoop, because we have to distribute it across machines, because a single machine cannot simply have more threads, because the performance will go down the more threads we actually create. So for this reason, we need to be able to create many, many, many machines. I spent my youth as a system administrator. It is a really a, a hard life sometimes. Uh, when I was uh, a system administrator, very young, uh, my wife still jokes about this to me. Because when I was married, I was actually a system administrator. Which meant my wife and I actually slept in the office. Because we had a baby to uh, sit, which is called the computers. And we have to keep this up in the running and feed it all the time. And the point is, it may crash anytime I have to go fix it. It was much easier to just sleep in the office than go home. And, and I would never wish that on anybody. But the point is, we cannot scale doing that today. Because we have literally thousands of machines that come to life when the demand goes up, and they disappear when the demand goes down. How in the world do we manage it? Well, 2007 to now, we have really learned the lessons of being elastic. Elastic services are absolutely phenomenal. Cloud computing is not a great idea. It's a practical solution we are using today. So reactive programming says the very first leg of the paradigm, build of the paradigm, is that we should make use of elastic applications. Uh, elastic servers, rather. And elasticity is very important. Uh, servers come to life, servers go away, depending on your demand, based on the time, or the load, or both. Well, the second thing is, how do we use data? I was in a meeting where this company was talking about using microservices. The meeting was going really well, until one developer asked this uh, unforgivable question. And the developer said, how do all my microservices talk to the central database? It is like somebody died in the room. Nobody spoke after that. Because you don't want multiple things to talk to a central database. Having a centralized database and distributed transaction is so 20th century. We don't do this. These are lessons we learned in the past, and we know now not to do that. So I have a slogan over here. And the slogan is, uh, so there are, there are a couple of things I uh, you know, emphasize. One is, uh, in life, uh, in life, we should, uh, we should uh, never share two things. And this is something I emphasize a lot. In life, we should never share two things. And the first is a toothbrush. 
Um, and, the, and the second is database. You know, very rarely, I might even, uh, I might even, you know, consider getting a toothbrush. Very rarely, but never a database. This is such a terrible idea. So uh, we should definitely not share, share these two things. We want to keep them absolutely separate from each other uh, and from the use. So my slogan here is, uh, do not expose your database instead export uh, your uh, data. So the second pillar of this paradigm is extremely important to do, and that is we should really engage with uh, message-driven uh, architectures. Again, message-driven is not new at all. We have done this a long a time ago. A lot of times we have done this, but React Programming greatly emphasizes this. So this is why technologies like Kafka or other technologies to really distribute data for our services becomes extremely important. The third thing it emphasizes is that our applications have to be uh, responsive. So responsiveness is extremely important. We are living today in the age of instant gratification. You go to an application, the application is really slow, you're going to move away and do other things. And sometimes people say, what did the application respond? They're like, what application? Well, the one you were using, oh, I'm sorry, I moved on to tweet and uh, Facebook and uh, other things. And then you go to the application, it still sucks, it's really slow. We're not going to be really spending time on applications that are not very responsive. Uh, we want applications that are responsive. When, think about the day we figured out responsiveness. You've been using this application for a while, it's a little crude and clunky, but that morning, it zapped back response really quickly. And you're thinking, boy, did I have a better network? Did they really change anything? And then you scroll up, and that's when your eyes are catching the point that there is no bottom. And the minute you realize it, before you could respond to it, and suddenly the bottom fills up with more data, you just discovered for the first time the so-called infinite scrolling. Infinite scrolling is a, such a wonderful idea for responsiveness, but rather than taking all the time you want to get all the data that they would never use, you are responding with minimum information. If they want more, they scroll up, and while they're looking at a part of the data, you are fetching the next part of the data, and you can be pipelining this data. That's a really nice way to make the, the system responsive. So responsiveness is extremely important in today's world because the applications we quit using are applications that are very slow to respond. You're, they, we don't want a full response, we want partial response, we want to keep ourselves you know, active with the response that's coming back, that's very important. The fourth thing that we are really interested here is uh, uh, resilience. Uh, resilience, uh, so resilience is extremely important, why? Resilience means that your app, well, you cannot create an application that never fails. Your application will fail. But what you really want is failing gracefully. That is extremely important. You know, how can somebody who creates an application that fails so badly survive in today's world? I'll tell you how they can do it. My experience, I, I travel a lot, as I said earlier. So I'm in uh, different countries almost every single week. I'm Fortunate, I don't have to get a visa for most of the places I travel to. I just walk to the border, give my passport, they say thanks for coming, so I'm really happy for it. But there are some countries I have to apply the visa for. One example is Russia. And I had to apply for a Russian visa. Um, so I went on, they said, you will apply, file for this application, here's the website. I call this the curse of the programmer. Because when you're a programmer, you assume every application sucks and your immediate senses creep in. What if this is gonna fail? So I said, okay, you want me to use an app to fill the visa application, what if this fails? I'm not even kidding with you. I went to the first page, it said enter all this data. For everything I enter on the page, I'm literally opening a notepad, copying and pasting in the notepad, and saving it. I'm like, I know what you guys are, you guys are programmers, and programmers suck generally. So I wanna make sure we are you know, saved here. So I'm just saving everything. I go to the second page, worst page ever, because the second page said, list all the countries you have visited. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so I go to all the time, enter all the data, all the countries I visited, when I visited, and the third page and the fourth page. And then I come to the fifth page, and the fifth page says, thank you for filling all this detail, click on submit. I make sure I save my notepad, and nervously I click on submit, <laughs> gone. I'm like, okay, uh, what do I do? And the beautiful words, start over. And I start over again. And I come to the submit page. I clicked on it. You know what happened? It disappeared again. 
And now a third time, this is called an act of desperation because I really want to go to Russia. So I filled this whole thing again and claimed and then click on the submit and this time it said accepted. I'm like, yes, this is awesome. <laughs> and then I realized if you want to survive in this world creating really bad applications, the only way you can do it is if you're part of the government. Because nobody else in the commercial world can ever survive this model, right? I don't know about a lot of governments, but I can tell you about my government and the Russian government. They both suck. But the point really is that this is really, uh, you know, unbelievable in the way that this is really being done. But resilience is extremely important. So what do we do? We are, the worst word we ever created is the word called exception. They should have called it normal. When well, this stuff happens, instead we call it exception, and then we get really angry when it happens. But the point really is, exceptions do happen. It reminds me of an experience. Um, I was speaking in a conference when a gentleman came up to me and said, hey Venkat, you probably don't remember me, but I took your distributed object computing course back in 1998, he said. I said, oh my goodness, I remember teaching that distributed object computing course in the 90s. Wow, it's great to see a past student, I said. I've been teaching at the university for about 30 years now, so I remember uh, you know, teaching that course, didn't remember the student uh, in this case, and then he said, well, I've got a story to tell you. I said, oh, I love stories, go for it, I want to know your story. He said, well, I was in your dispute object computing course, I was uh, doing a final demo for the course, and while I was doing that, remember this was the 90s when we had internet cables, not Wi-Fi. Wi so um, uh, I was doing the demo for your course, and in the middle of the demo, you walked up to my machine, disconnected the internet cable, went back and sat down and said, continue. My program absolutely crashed, and I failed the course because I failed the project. I said, why are you telling me this? This is a tragedy, not a story. Why do you want to tell me this story? He said, because there's a happy ending. I said, how could there be a happy ending with you, where it starts with you failing my course? He said, well, you see, because it's the last day I ever did that mistake. You taught me, in a very hard way, an important lesson in my life, that I should not go for the happy path, I should always think of the unhappy path. And then he went on to say, now in my work, I do really good programming, thanks to you, because in my office, in my cubicle, on the wall, I have a picture of Evil Venkat. And I look at this picture every day when I code. I honestly don't know how this picture of Evil Venkat looks like, but the point is we really have to program for the unhappy path as well. Resilience is extremely important. So reactive programming emphasizes these four things, elasticity, message-driven, responsiveness, and resilience in building applications. And, and this is what we really want to move towards, is to be able to support these things in developing the applications. So given these four things, elasticity, uh, responsiveness, resilience, and message-driven, how do we go about really achieving this? Well, this is where I really started digging into this, and, and it was more of a, call me silly, but it was more of an aha moment for me until I really realized it. And as I was struggling to understand reactive programming, I was always asking the question, oh, what does this relate to what I really know already? And it was kind of like feeling a vacuum until I just jumped out of my seat one day because I finally realized what this is. And, and that was uh, reactive programming is uh, functional programming plus plus. And, and that's what was my realization, is that reactive programming builds on top of functional programming. And, and why I say this is, what are the core capabilities of functional programming? To me, there are only two important things in functional programming. And that is, we want functional, uh, functional uh, composition. So it builds on functional composition uh, and uh, also lazy uh, evaluation. So these are the two things it, it literally builds on top of. So reactive programming starts and builds on functional composition and lazy evaluation. And, and that was my first realization is, aha, this is nothing really completely alien. Uh, it is actually a really nice transition. So when people ask me today, in the future, will functional programming be very prevalent? My answer is no, in the future, reactive programming will be very prevalent. And the reason I say this is, reactive programming is really a nice application of functional programming. And that's exactly what I want to show you here, is how these concepts start here and then move forward from these ideas. So to understand this, 
Let's take a few examples and work with it. So let's start with Java 8 streams. Remember Java 8 streams are very powerful, but also have some limitations. I want to compare Java 8 streams to what are called reactive streams, and, and learn about the similarities and the differences. The first similarity is Java 8 streams is a functional uh, pipeline. Uh, we talked about this earlier. It is a functional pipeline. And guess what? Reactive streams are a functional uh, pipeline as well. So both of those are functional pipelines. Uh, that's the very first thing about these two. They both are functional pipelines. Second thing is they both have lazy evaluation. So Java 8 streams is lazy, and reactive streams are lazy also. So they both are lazily evaluated. The similarities are going to end very quickly, unfortunately. What does the Java 8 streams uh, send across? They send the data only, whereas reactive streams send data also. So these two are uh, dealing with data as, a, as a, a, a stream of data. Oh, another thing. Uh, in the case of a uh, reactive stream, you can have zero, one, or more data. You can pass nothing through a stream. You can pass just one data to a stream, or you can keep sending data any number of times you want to. Similarly, reactive streams can have zero, one, or more data. Unfortunately, that's the end of the similarities. And now uh, the differences are pretty wide, as we're going to see in just a few minutes. But let's just look at these parts first before we go any further. So let's go ahead and take a look at an example here. I'm going to use RxJava. There are several implementations out there. You can pick your poison, but I'm going to use RxJava. RxJava was created by Netflix. Apparently, they had some streaming problems to deal with, so they decided to open source their solution. So in this case, I'm going to create a flowable. And in this, I'm going to create a flowable dot. And I'll say integer uh, and create. And I will then create an emitter. Uh, I'll say emitter, and then I'll pass it to an emit method, which receives the emitter. Well, a little function, then I'm going to output created right now. Well, obviously, we need an emit function to work with this. So I'm going to create the emit method. And what am I going to do the emit method? I'm going to simply say starting to emit. Well, first of all, the reactive streams are absolutely lazy. So for now, I'm going to simply say buffer, uh, back, uh, buffer uh, sorry, back pressure. Don't worry about it right now. We'll talk about this more. But when I run this code, notice that it says created, but it never said starting to emit. And the reason is you are saying, hey, uh, Flowable, what are you doing? And the Flowable says, tell me what you are doing with what I gave you. Oh, nothing. Well, if you're not doing anything, it's only fair I don't do anything either. It's pretty lazy, as you can see. In fact, you can try to piece it a little bit. You can go to this and say, OK, dot math, given a piece of data, return data times 1. And the reactive stream says, I know what you're trying to do, but I'm not going to budge to you. It is still lazy. Because you're not doing anything with the data, why should it work extra hard to uh, do stuff when you're going to discard what it's doing? It's absolutely lazy, as you can see. But instead, what I'm going to do now is to say, all right, I'm going to get the data and do some processing with it. So I say subscribe. And given a piece of data, I want to simply output the data. So now you can see I'm just outputting the data. When I run this code this time, it says, all right, now we have an agreement. I will start to emit because you're using the data that I'm actually sending to you. So you can see the laziness in this code so far. But then again, what am I going to do over here? Well, I want to generate a data, obviously. So we saw the function composition right here. So we saw the first one was a functional pipeline. You saw it is lazy. It is going to send data, zero, more, or zero or more. You already saw it was sending zero data. Well, what if I want to send more data? Well, I'm going to say count is equal to zero. And in this case, I'll say while count is less than 10, I'm going to increment the count, and then I'm going to then say uh, emitter dot on next, and then I will pass the count over to the caller. But as I'm sending it, I'll output emitting, and then we will simply print out the count to say that I'm emitting that particular data. And then once I emit it, uh, I will just keep going until in the end, I'll say emitter dot on complete, and I'll say that I'm done, I have no more data for you. When I execute this code this time, though, notice that it is emitting the data. And as it is emitting the data, 
you can see that we are receiving the data and printing it. This is a synchronous solution that we are looking at right now. I know it's a very trivial example, but nevertheless it shows how an emitter can emit the data and a subscriber can subscribe to it after transforming and filtering and so on if they are really interested in it. Well, that uh, leads us to looking at some differences at this point. Let's talk about a few differences before we go any further. The first difference I want to talk about is, uh, you know, what if something goes wrong? So that's the very first question we have to ask. What if something were to go wrong? I'm going to tell you what Java 8 Stream does for this. Uh, the Java 8 Stream solution can be described in two English words. And those words are called good luck. And that's basically <laughs> what it is, right? If something were to go wrong, it's a good luck. Go sit in a corner and cry about it. I can't do anything for you. Well, why? Because if you really think about it, what does Java 8 Stream do when something goes wrong? When you have an ex ex uh, uh, exception, uh, what, is, what does it do? It blows up your pipeline. Now, think, think about this for a minute. A friend of yours calls you and says, I'm driving on the freeway, I have a flat tire, what do I do? Your recommendation is blow up the freeway. I don't think that's a really good answer, right? We never want to say something like that. It makes no sense at all. But that's exactly what Java 8 does. Java 8 says blow up the pipeline. Well, I'm sorry, that makes no sense. What do we do then? Well, this is where the reactive streams have an answer. The reactive streams have three channels of communication. The first channel is called the data channel, through which data goes. The second channel is called the error channel, through which error goes through. And the third is called the complete channel, through which a complete signal can pass through. So they actually maintain these three different channels of communication. A data channel, an error channel, and also a complete channel. Let's take a look at these three before we go any further. So let's look at the complete channel to begin with. Notice right here, I sent a message called on complete. After this, I'm going to send an emitter dot on next, but this time I'm going to send a minus one. I know this is not, doesn't make sense to do it, but let's send a message after we complete. Well, the beauty of this is the data channel has the data, but the minute an error happens or a complete signal is sent, the data channel will close up. And no more data will go through the data channel, but on the other hand, uh, data will be sent through the uh, data channel as long as there's no error, as long as there's no complete signal. As you can see in this example, if I come here and say error, and then I'm going to output the error colon, and then I'm going to display the error comma, and then I'm going to just display output done right here. When I execute this code, notice that it says done in the very end after printing the 10, but notice it did not ever emit for us the value of minus one because the data channel closes the minute the complete channel is sent, and that is what we just saw here. But what about the error? Well, as far as the error is concerned, that is where the error channel comes in. I never thought I would, in my real life, live an example I give in my classes. Usually, I'm a big fan of analogies and metaphors, and I always give an example in the class from the real life. This one was the nature and reverse. I gave an example in my class for a good two years, and I never thought one day I would actually live that. Um, this happened in January. I was speaking of the Boston Java user, user group, and I spoke in the Java user group, had a really good time. Uh, you know, it was over fairly late in the evening. Uh, it was probably about 9.30 in the, in the night, and I had a flight to Montreal uh, the very next morning at 6.30 a.m. And I said to myself, I'm a word traveler. Yes, it's an international flight, but it's just across the border to the Canada. I don't need to go early on. I'm going to just take it easy and travel like a boss. So I get up at 4 in the morning, and I said, I'll just go to the airport. I can handle this. And I start driving to the airport. Well, it had snowed through the night. So the entire streets were covered by snow. And I was cautiously driving on the right lane. Now I know it's a bad idea. As I was driving on the right lane, I heard a little thud, and within seconds, my car was not making really good progress. So I parked my car, turned off the ignition, looked around, there was absolutely nobody sane at 4.15 in the morning. The entire streets are empty. I get on from my car, walk over to the front side, the right side, I take a look at it, and I notice that the tire is completely flat. There's no air at all. 
And I'm uh, sitting there and scratching my head alone on the street of Boston, not knowing what to do with the car that has a flat tire right now. I got a flight in, uh, at 6.30 in the morning. It's 4.15 in, in, the, in the morning. What do I do? And I picked up the phone, I called the towing service, and I said, hey, I've got a problem here, I have a flat tire. Well, the towing service uh, responded very nicely. It said, you're a very important customer to us. Uh, our estimate time of arrival to rescue you is two hours and 30 minutes. I'm like, oh, that's not going to help. The flight will be gone by then. I really wanted to get to Montreal. I had the, uh, talks during the day. I definitely don't want to disappoint people that are you know, inviting me there. So I sat there in the car thinking, what am I going to do? And suddenly this example that I give in the class came to my mind. And the example I always gave is this. So the question is, what if something goes wrong? And the answer in reactive programming is the following. And the answer is, deal with it <laughs> downstream. And that's exactly what it is. I got back in the car, turned on the ignition, and I just started driving. And I drove all the way to the airport. You should have seen the people in the airport when I drove in. It was a big noise rolling in, because obviously it's now driving on the, not the tire, but on the rim. And it was making a huge noise as it pulled in. And they looked at me and said, what's up with you? I said, oh, it's just a flat tire. Oh, by the way, here's the key. This is one time you're so happy it's a rental car. So I returned the rental car, and I just take, took my trip. I was absolutely fine. I landed in Montreal on time. Everything went fine for about two weeks. I was in Europe by the time my wife called me on the phone and said, oh, that little incident you had in Boston, I got the bill from the rental company. I took a sip of water and said, I'm sitting down, go for it. She said, oh, they sent you a bill for $85. I'm like, I can handle that, that's great. And that's exactly the point, deal with it downstream. So the point really is, when something goes wrong, deal with it downstream. So what are we going to do to deal with it downstream? So to understand this, let's go back to this example. And right here in the middle, if count is equal to 7, then throw. Notice how I'm going to blow up from this functional pipeline. Not a good thing, isn't it? So throw new runtime exception. Let's send a message like we normally get in production. Something went wrong. So, so we just blow up with that little error. Now notice what's going to happen. This code is blowing up with an exception right in the middle, but the reactive stream says, we don't do such stuff. That's very uncivil. You don't want to blow up. I mean, think about this for a minute. You're talking to somebody, and what if they start throwing things at you suddenly? You're like, whoa, wait a minute. Why are you throwing things at me? Well, that's Java way of programming, right? No, we're civil. If I don't like something, I tell you I don't like it in a civil way and give you a chance to fix it. Well, that's exactly what this is going to do. This is going to blow up right in the middle, but it's going to capture that blow up and quietly send the data. Error is a data as well. So what is going on here? Exceptions, sorry, error is, uh, sorry, a failure, a failure uh, is a first class uh, citizen. Uh, so that is the first thing. Uh, failure is a first class citizen. And error is just another form of data. So we don't treat this as something alien. We don't treat this as something completely different. We treat them as all the same. And error is just another form of data. And we deal with it downstream. So notice in the code example I'm looking at right now, what it's going to do is to capture that exception and terminate the data stream and politely send a signal to the error channel to say, hey, something went wrong, deal with it. It's built on the model of circuit breakers. It's not going to keep pushing data to you when a failure happens. It gives you opportunity to recover it when that were to happen. So as a result in here, notice, when I blow up, when I execute this code, notice that at this point when I execute this code, you will notice it starts emitting data. But the minute it emits a value of 7, it, it, is, it is saying that runtime exception, something went wrong. But notice error right there being displayed. That shows us that we are actually here in the error channel. That's the three channels we talked about, the data channel, the error channel, and the complete channel as well. And that's basically how that's communicating the data back to you. So this has a lot of similarities to completable future. Completable future only contains data channel and error channel, whereas reactive streams contain three channels, data channel, error channel, and complete channel. Completable future will only take zero or one data through the stream. This can be zero or many throughout. 
then comes a few more differences. And the next difference here is, when it comes to the streams, if you will, the streams have a property of sequential versus parallel. You can do sequential processing in a stream, you can do parallel processing in a stream. On the other hand, reactive streams go a little differently. They are synchronous versus a, uh, asynchronous in, in the nature. So rather than being sequential versus parallel, they're actually synchronous versus asynchronous. Let's understand synchrony versus asynchrony here with a little example right here. In this example we just saw, we are dealing with uh, synchrony. That's what we are really working with. We are dealing with a synchronous solution. That's the default solution that you are looking at is a synchronous solution. But that's not a good thing because one of the things you have to be very careful about is uh, speed at which different things are going to execute. Uh, that's another thing to really consider, uh, and, and how do we really manage that speed? So to understand this, let's look at an example real quickly. Let's go back to this code. Let's introduce a sleep function, and in this case, as I'm emitting the data, once I emit the data, I'll say sleep for about 500 milliseconds. Notice, I'm going to generate data every half a second. Well, if I run the code right now, you will notice that the emitting happens every half a second. However, I'm going to go back to the receiving end, and in the receiving end, I'm going to say over here, uh, a sample colon colon printed, where printed is a method I'm going to write within the class, and here I receive a value, I output the value, but I will sleep for a second after I emit it. When I run the code, notice the emitting is slow based on the receiver. This is not a very good thing in general. Well, this is a sequential solution. How do I really handle this differently? One way to handle this differently is, let's go ahead and add a little delay here so the program doesn't quit too prematurely. But I'm going to go back here and say, uh, dot <coughs> observe on. And in this case, I'll provide a schedulers dot. And I would say I'm a computation intensive, IO intensive, doesn't really matter for our example. And I'm going to then ask it to run this asynchronously in the code. So now that I've asked it to run asynchronously, what does it really do? If I run the code this time, notice the emits are happening faster than the receiving, and the emit is actually moving a little forward, as you can see. Let me remove this blow up from the code, and if I re-execute this code right here, let's go ahead and say now, I'm going to run this code, notice that the emitting is faster, half a second, the receiving is slower, so what are we really talking about in this case? What we are really talking about in this case is a difference in this programming model, and, and that is, in this programming model, we are talking about asynchrony, but with something else which is very critical. In the case of a Java 8 stream, uh, it is uh, push as, uh, you know, at your pace. This is basically a push at your pace. Well, that's not a very pleasant thing to do because it doesn't care about the receiver. Well, one rule of reactive programming is a subscriber cannot control the publisher and the publisher cannot control the subscriber. They can be at various different speed, whatever speed they want to. A publisher can be really fast or can be very slow. A subscriber can be really fast or they can be slow. So what do we really need to do is we need to really be able to do back pressure. And back pressure is built into the reactive streams as well. You can see how it starts in a way we are dealing with functional programming and builds on the abstraction on top of it. This is why I called it functional programming plus plus because it nicely builds on top of the paradigm very quickly. So we have the back pressure right here, and the back pressure is extremely important. We're actually seeing the back pressure right now. Notice right here, I said back pressure is buffered, meaning I want to buffer your data as you're sending it to me. As a result, when I run this code, notice the emitting is actually over right about now. But the buffered stream is sending us the buffered data. I can take my sweet time to process it. There are times when I don't want buffering. It really is application specific. 
In some applications, I want buffering because I may have a period of normalcy, but I may have a period of slowness, and I will recover back, and I want you to buffer the data. I want to process everything that comes through it. Like cars going through a toll booth, I want to process all the cars that go through a toll booth, but there may be time when I'm trying to really find out some you know, connection problem. I want you to buffer and not lose data. There are other times like you have a, a car service that's sending you a car to pick you up, your application doesn't care where the car has been, you want to know where the car is right now. So if you switch to something else and switch back to the app, you don't want the application to say, I'll take the next 10 minutes to show you where the car has come through, you're like, show me where the car is now. Drop everything else, I don't care about it. So in that case, you can do a drop, and the drop simply says, I don't care about stuff if I'm busy. Notice the emitting is going at a half a second interval, but the receiver is not uh, as fast, but it dropped away three and four, I received five on the receiving end. It dropped away seven and eight, I received nine on the receiving end. That's an example of a drop. You also have a few other capabilities as well. For example, you have a latest right here. What's the difference between latest and drop? Latest and drop is, if let's say you are a subscriber, I'm a publisher, I send you a data, you're busy right now, I'm gonna keep throwing things because you're busy. Then you say, hey, I'm ready. I'm like, okay, thanks for letting me know. Uh, are you not giving me anything? I don't have anything to give. I'll give it to you when I have next data, not otherwise. That is drop. So when I have a data, if you're not busy, I'll give it to you. If you're busy, I'll throw it away. That's what drop means. Latest says, oh, you're busy, I'll keep the latest. Oh, I have one more. Oh, I have one more. I have one more. And the minute you are ready, oh, here you go. So I will give you the data right away because I'm holding on to the latest. So it's a small difference. You get the latest versus you'll get the next one generated when you become uh, you know, unoccupied. That's the difference between those two. Uh, then there's also a few other solutions here. You can pick and choose what you really want to. Uh, there's one called error. I call this the in-law model. It screams at you if you're not fast enough. I'm not a big fan of that. So you can take, pick and choose the model you're really interested in, and you can use that as well. So that shows us how we can work with it. The differences, as you can see, are quite wide. We're not even done with it. So then comes along the next question. How does a stream work in reality? I apologize before I give you this example because this is a very gross example. But once you hear this example, you will never forget it because it's that gross. So what is a stream like? A stream is like Q-tips. Um, you know, you'd never reuse a Q-tip. I know that's really gross. Use a Q-tip once and you throw it away. That's what you teach the children, right? So you don't want to, re reuse is a good thing in software, not in Q-tips. Uh, stream is like a Q-tip. You don't reuse Q-tips. You just use it once and throw it away, right? So use and throw. And, and that is exactly how uh, streams actually work. More important, no forking. So your streams don't have forking. This is more of a limitation how Java 8 is implemented. They don't give you the, the use and uh, reuse and they don't give you forking. What I mean by that is this. Suppose my arm is a stream. You can transmit data through the stream in Java 8 any number of times, but I fork it, and I say, my data will go this way once, and my data will go this way, and I will send this in a fork. You're not allowed to do this in Java 8 streams. This will actually fail with the runtime error exception if you're trying to fork <coughs> your stream. That's not allowed. Well, what about reactive streams, though? Reactive streams, on the other hand, uh, or uh, you can have multiple subscribers. So this gives you the ability to do multiple subscribers in your solution, which is really powerful, isn't it? So what happens when you have multiple subscribers? That becomes the next question. So if I have a publisher and I have multiple subscribers to it, like these two microphones, for example, I'm the one speaking, but both of them are really subscribing to it. How does it really work is the real question to ask. There are two answers to this. There's no real one right answer to this question. There are two answers. One is called cold, another is called hot. Let me explain what that really means. So let's to understand this, let's take a slightly different example and, and play with it. So what I'm going to do here is create a flowable that becomes a lot easier to work with and understand how this actually uh, functions. So, uh, so what I'm going to do here is take a flowable 
And in this case, I'll create an interval. Uh, let's generate uh, the data every, uh, let's say, uh, time unit, a uh, dot second. So every second, I'm going to generate a piece of data, but I store it away into what's called a feed. OK, now I'm going to sleep for about 10 seconds in the end. And uh, what I'm going to do within the sleep is uh, I'm going to, before I sleep, I'm going to uh, uh, subscribe to it. So I say feed.subscribe. And in this case, when I get the data, I will go ahead and call print it, and I will pass to it S1 colon uh, plus the data. So a very simple example, as you can see, I'm going to just print it out. What does the printed do? Printed is going to take a message and simply output the message. So run the code, nothing really exciting. You can see that every second it's printing a message. That's basically what we're seeing. So that is the one, uh, you know, one pipeline. You are generating the data, and here's a subscriber, and you're just using it. But the question is, what, what's going to happen if you have multiple subscribers? How do you handle this? So to understand this, let's leap for about five seconds. At the end of the five seconds, I'm going to call subscribe one more time. And this time, I take the data, but I'm going to pass it to S2 colon, and, and I'm going to print the data. So this time around, this is the default behavior. The default is code. So what that means is, I, I, I like to use the word called session. So, se uh, but it's actually called as subscription. So you can call it as a session, you can call it as a subscription. So think about it this way. Imagine you have two children at home, a boy and a girl, and you decide to subscribe to a science magazine. So as a good parent, you said, it's good for the children to learn this, uh, from this magazine, so I'm going to subscribe to the science magazine. Well, you get one magazine in the house, but you got a boy and a girl, and they both want to read the magazine. What is that called? It's called an act of war, isn't it? Because then the children start fighting. So you say, you know what, I'm going to just get two subscriptions to the same magazine, one for one child, the other for another child. Well, it's possible that one may arrive before the other one does. There's still war in the house because of that. But the point is, at least there's a revolution afterwards. They both have their own copies. Well, that's kind of what we're doing. It's one data feed, one publisher, but we have two subscribers, subscriber one and subscriber two. So there are two different subscriptions, so their view is very different from one another. And that's exactly what happens here. Let me give you another example of this. Uh, let's say I'm on message, and I'm messaging my wife, let's say. And I'm talking to her, a few minutes goes by, my good friend Scott comes on uh, message, uh, on iMessage, now I'm chatting with both of them. Well, you know what, this is perfectly fine, isn't it? What I'm telling my wife is none of Scott's business, what I'm telling Scott is none of my wife's business. These are completely two different conversations, one has absolutely nothing with another, and nothing ever goes wrong most of the time. But occasionally, I would type, I love you, and there'll be a long delay, and then Scott eventually says, what the heck, I love you too, and I'm like, oh, sorry, he's like, yeah, I know, you're talking to the wife on the other line. He's like, yeah. So the point is, this is completely isolated, shouldn't really get mixed up. Run the code, let's see what it does. S1 kicks in, as you can see, it is transmitting the data, five seconds goes by, S2 kicks in, notice the state is very different, that is two different conversations. So in other words, these are completely two different sessions. I'm not suggesting that they restart uh, the particular data sequence. What I am actually saying here is the publisher will start a new subscription. Whatever that means to the publisher, the publisher may say, you're a new subscriber. I'm going to send you a completely different set of data than what I sent for this other one. Or it could be the same. It could be different. Who knows what it is? But it's two different conversations. That's the most important thing. On the other hand, it's times when you want the same conversation for multiple subscribers. Like, for example, um, I, I, it took me a while to figure this out. Maybe it's the, it's the case in your house, too. Uh, but this is something that took me a while to uh, realize. Um, my wife would call me on the phone uh, when, when, you know, all the time I travel. And, and, and I noticed over time, I started noticing a pattern when she talks to me. When she starts the conversation saying, do you know what our son did today? Versus she starts a conversation, do you know what your son did today? And it took me a while to realize, when she says our son, it's usually some phrase words. When she says your son, it's like, what did you do wrong today? And it took me a while to figure this out. And, and, and so if you're going to after all, you know, call the child and scold, it's better to have the parents jointly scold the child in once, 
that's a lot better. Otherwise, otherwise, the children know a trick to you know, say different things to different parents. You want to be really consistent. So I want to rope them together. How do I do this? Very simple. You go back up here, and then you say dot share, and that becomes a heart, uh, 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 you know, a producer. So when I run this code this time, notice that S1 started out with a subscription. Five seconds goes by, and then you can see that S2 joined in, but they are sharing the same session as well, and you can manage that pretty effectively, as you can see in this example. So this really brings us to the similarities and differences uh, uh, between the Java 8 streams and, and the reactive streams. We started nicely with some similarities, but you can see that we are building on that foundation, but we are quickly diverging as well, and we are seeing how this is really moving towards a lot more powerful abstraction we are building on top of that. Uh, and as we are working with more and more APIs, while functional programming is definitely exciting, don't get me wrong, I love it, I, I'm still learning it uh, and embracing it, I'm, I'm taking my few decades of imperative style of programming and I'm catching up to the time with functional programming. But then when I started programming with the reactive programming, uh, it was like a, you know, a, a little light bulb goes in my head when I realized that reactive programming is not a very alien concept, it's really a functional programming plus plus, that's why I called it that. It, it really starts on the foundation and, and builds on top of it with, uh, with nice abstractions, as we can see in this case. And, and as we're looking at different solutions, there's Akka, there's React, uh, Rx Java, there's Reactor, there's, uh, you know, Vertex has solutions for this as well. RxJS in the case of JavaScript, Rx.net, almost every single language worth its salt has a reactive library on top of it. Uh, databases and uh, libraries are supporting ability to take data from a database now and start streaming them. Like, for example, MongoDB, as one example, already has libraries to stream data. So you don't have to keep querying for more data. You just open a stream and just connect to it. And as you are getting the data, it starts streaming the data towards you. And, and you can also have a back pressure where you can request a piece of number of data and you can manage the back pressure that way as well using a publishing subscriber model. So this is, uh, when I started talking about this maybe, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years ago, I can't even remember when I started talking about it, I used to start my talk saying, hey, one day this would be really exciting, it's a nice idea to look at. Well, that day is today. Uh, it's no longer a nice idea. We are having libraries that implement it quite effectively today. We are beginning to see uh, libraries that are effectively using it. We are beginning to see applications where uh, this is the way of writing things. And uh, this is one of the reasons I see this as a next paradigm shift. Uh, I feel almost like my journey through object-oriented programming, uh, then you wake up one day and you realize you're writing code very differently than you started out with, for better or worse, and that's exactly the feeling I'm getting today as well. I think in the next uh, you know, five to ten years, we're going to be developing applications very differently than we've been developing for the past you know, uh, 15, 20 years. And I think uh, you know, it's a really good, exciting time to be uh, in this field for those reasons. And, uh, and that's, that's my journey through to learn and understand reactive programming. I hope you found that useful. Thank you. Do we have some time for questions? Um, questions? Questions, comments, anything anybody wants to talk about. We'd delight to hear. Please. So the question is about core routines. Yes. So so um, it it really is. So that they're a little bit orthogonal to each other in that sense. Uh, the way I see it is more than core routines. I want to go a little for, forward to uh, talking about um, you know if you will um, core uh, sorry um, continuations uh, because to me it's a conversational state. So so let me put it this way. Suppose I'm going to be streaming data. I'm just a data producer. I could have many subscribers. Um, they initially initiate a conversation with me, but I'm going to just generate data based on the realities on my side. Uh, the reactive stream makes a really good sense. On the other hand, if there's a conversational state between the subscriber and the publisher, where you get some data, but you want to carry back some state back to me so I can, you can even change the course of my direction, 
uh, continuations and authorities make a little bit more uh, sense in that regard. Uh, we are beginning to really tap into reactiveness right now. We are not quite there with continuations yet, uh, at least in the Java world. There are third party solutions, there are also other languages where that's a little bit more popular. We haven't really gotten to that point in Java. I think in the next several years we'll begin to learn more about this and, and see better ways to apply. Yep, please. Is it possible to move from the error channel to the data channel, to come back from the error channel? Because right. stopping in the error is not, uh, it's just uh, like try cut in, uh, when using scene. Got you. So the question is, you know, hey, uh, got an error, uh, can I recover, keep moving forward? Can I go back to the data channel? Uh, the short answer is no, you cannot do that uh, because it's built on the concept of circuit breakers. However, here's what you can do. Imagine for a minute that this is a, a, a producer, but it's also a subscriber. And I'm going to put it between you and me. Let's say I'm the publisher, you're the subscriber. So I'm going to put it in between you and me, but it's going to duck and wait. So I start transmitting data. We could have transformations between, and then you will see the data. At some point, let's say I fail. And the minute I fail, this will raise up and say, I'm going to take over as a new data source. So you can do something like that. And for doing that, what you do is you say, on error, uh, resume, uh, on error, uh, resume next. And you can provide an alternative uh, provider. So, so you cannot revise the same producer, but you can reconnect for a new producer. And then depending on, depending on the application, you can, you can do something like that. Please. Really good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, I'll tell you why I don't like it. I, I, I'm not saying I don't like what Scala is doing. I'm saying why I don't like that approach. Because that's the exact approach Haskell uses too. And I'll tell you in one word why I don't like it. The word is cohesion. And what I mean by that is, when you are, so, so definitely uh, that's a good solution when you don't have any other solution. And then the reason I say that is, when you're passing this either object, and in the case of Haskell they call it the maybe monad, and what you do is, you're passing either the data or the error through your uh, you know, pipeline. Well, the burden on me is, when I get a data now, I have to either look at the data part, or I have to look at the error part. My code is not cohesive anymore because I'm constantly going between these two. Uh, when you have pattern matching in like Scala, it becomes a little bit more elegant to write the code, right? Because you're saying, when I put a pattern, I can put a you know, case in there. If it's an error, do this. If it's a data, you do this. Even then, I would argue that's not very cohesive. Uh, a lot of times, this is why the promises solution and the completable future solution is what I like a lot better, because what that does is, it has these two channels. And you keep going on the data channel, you can keep going on the error channel, and then you can go back and forth when you want to. That model is a little bit more appealing to me because my code is more cohesive when I write it that way. So purely from the cohesion point of view, I favor keeping them separate than that uh, maybe one or a, a, either object. So I often say that's a good solution when you don't have an alternative, uh, but, but that wouldn't be my go-to solution from the design point of view. So, so that's my take on it. Thank you. Thank you very much.